The following program is an original production of WICC PBS Chicago. Closed captioning for the professors is provided in part by the Clifford Law Offices, a personal injury and wrongful death law firm in Chicago. When it comes to teaching science, have American schools falling behind the rest of the world? And if so, what are we doing about it? And what are the long-term implications if we do nothing? That's the focus of our discussion today on The Professors. Joining us today to talk about the status of science education in American schools are Shion Phillips, co-founder of Project Sincere, Robin Watley, professor of science at Columbia College, and Dr. Nick Panamitros, attorney and professor. Welcome all. Thank you. Okay, so the status of science in education. I think uh, it, science has, of course, been in the media lately because it's always affixed to the word STEM. We all know STEM is the initiative behind the Department of Education, which is attached to this re, I would say this re envisioned industrial movement, science, technology, engineering, and math. Yes? Mm -hmm. Okay, so when it comes to science and education, what say you, Robin? It's important. We have to have science in education. Mm -hmm. And I think it's uh, sometimes arbitrary whether it's taught, especially in grades one through six. Okay. Shill? I believe, as well as she's saying, that it's very important because it really shapes how one can think in terms of critical thinking and problem solving skills, which are very important. And science does encompass those two areas of skills. Um, I agree with uh, both people here. I, I think also the uh, fact, you know, sciences really exercise the brain. I mean, they, um, there are finite answers to many questions, and you really uh, exercise the brain. Uh, in some of the other areas, you don't do it quite the same way. And so I think uh, the rigorous exercising is important. Now, I think it's really important. I am all, um, one thing for certain is one of my soapboxes is I, really think that there is a void of critical thinking in our higher education. I think it's why we get the results of the type of people that we have today, um, but I'll digress. What I want to talk about is, is that if science is so important and if science, especially in an auxiliary way, helps to reinforce critical thinking, it also <coughs> helps to encourage to think innovatively, right? Mm -hmm. Then why is it, why does it, when, at the grand <coughs> scheme of things, when we roll out the curriculum, it's hard to find it. Why is it so unimportant on paper, but if we understand that when we're talking about it socially, that it is important? What's, what's the disconnect? Well, I think in the schools, it seems like we're stuck with the standards of 120 years ago. And I think that they need to be looked at and implemented in the schools um, more comprehensively. Tell me about the new standard. Now, you're saying there are some new science standards that are out? Well, it's, it's, they've not been implemented, but there is a, I think it's the second draft of the next generation um, science standards. Mm -hmm. And there are over 50 scientists across the United States who have gotten together and um, put together this framework for how these standards will be taught in grades K through 12. And so I, I was looking at this, and I think that it actually has a, a precursor in California and was implemented there because one of the names that I saw when I was looking through the names in these standards um, is Tanya Atwater, and she's actually a geophysicist who was heavily involved in K-12 through science education, even though she was a professor mm -hmm. at UC Santa Barbara when I was in school there. And um, this is a draft. It's been put forward for people to look at. I think it came out less than a month ago. And so it would be voluntary, but there are, I think, um, uh, 26 participating states in putting these standards together. And it's much like the, um, the reading and math standards that came out um, in 2010 and are now being implemented in the schools. And I think those are supposed to actually be implemented how in do, 2013 through 2014. So how do those standards look? Is it, does it seem relevant? Does it seem like they're reinventing the wheel? No, no, they're completely relevant. And at the heart of it, they're trying to get students interested in the wonder and beauty of science, but actually 
have students doing the kinds of things that you have them doing with your program, and that is uh, learning about the basic concepts, uh, building models, uh, analyzing data, actual data, mm -hmm. and they do it at different levels depending on the grades. So like for instance, uh, if you're in, I think it was fifth grade, you might learn about weather, but by the time you get to high school, you're learning about climate change. And these are important topics that everybody needs to know about, whether you're going to become a scientist or not. Well, let's add to perfect sake. So Sean, tell us about Project Sincere. So Project Sincere, our, our mission is to increase the number of minorities to pursue careers in science, technology, engineering, and math. And the way we do that is by us going into the school systems during the school day and after school and students being able to participate in different projects. So as Robin's saying, we really want the relevancy to come into the students' lives. And as they're building different projects, for instance, robotics, um, cars, fuel cell, renewable energy, we want students to take the concepts that they're learning inside their, in their classwork and relate them to these projects. So it's not just a matter of students memorizing equations mm -hmm. or uh, being able to recite things that they've learned in class. It's a, it's a matter of them getting that knowledge that they've learned from their math and their science classes into building projects. So now they're able to see, okay, this is why I'm learning about trigonometry, because I'm able to apply it to building this electrical circuit. I'm able to do these different conversions, and now they start to get the, like, how this relates to the real world, and that's what we really strive to do. So it's really driving, for, <coughs> driving home the importance of relevancy. Correct. So it's driving for the, the relevancy and for students to see why. Why am I doing this, and how do I apply it? So let me ask you this. So what do you say to the student that says, so why should I study science? Uh, I tell them in terms of not only do they increase their critical thinking and problem solving skills, but it, it's, it's around them. So everything they do, they, they see science and the, how the world works. Mm -hmm. um, they may be driving in, um, in their cars, and one core topic is engineering. So driving over a bridge, they start to see these different structures. What makes this bridge stand up? Mm -hmm. Why is it that... Um, their table, their desk that they're sitting at, why is it designed that way? The fact that they can sit down, they don't sit down in the chair thinking that it's going to break. An engineer really designed the different concepts of the chair to support different weights. So now they start to go around in their everyday lives and, and things start to make sense to them. What? To mention the mm -hmm. fact that you, isn't the average engineering um, salary about $75,000? Right. Right. So that might be a good reason to actually go into engineering. Right. Let me ask you this, How, why do you think science has fallen off over the years? Is it just because it has not, is, be, is because there's less interest or less, ex, less exposure of NASA, which now kind of sparred the interest for people to think in, in other ways? Is it because it's not as sexy? What's, what's the deal? So I would say, I mean, it's still sexy. The thing that... That's I, right, there you go. Science <laughs> is sexy. Science is sexy. Yes, yes. You can't forget that. Um, it's a matter of the focus that we're putting towards it. Um, as, as Robin's saying, as we start focusing these new uh, next generation science standards to have science, and it's a requirement, schools are definitely going to shift that way. But if it's not a major requirement within the school system, and they're testing and they're preparing their schools and their students for these tests, they're not going to have that type of importance and they won't exert as much energy into teaching science. Now, it's funny I you should say that because in preparing for the show, we uh, managed to get a uh, really good interview with uh, biology teacher in the suburban uh, of D Detroit. And this is what he said. He said, it starts in elementary. The three R's are the fundamentals, taught and emphasized. But last I looked, science has no R in it. Most elementary teachers are weak in the sciences, and I believe having them to do at least four full lab write-ups per year would have a great impact. Yeah? I agree. Um, in terms of, also, if we're able to do this, we need to teach and train the teachers properly. A lot of schools that we do go into, teachers don't feel as comfortable teaching the sciences, and that's where we come in. And for them just to have our program in the school is not enough. It needs to be, um, they need to get as much practice as possible with these sciences and in order to get the retention rate high. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need. Go ahead, Nick. Yeah, no, Nick, I'm, what you want to say? I was going to say, the sciences are, are usually difficult. The curriculums are usually more rigorous. I remember in undergrad, you know, you'd have a two-hour chemistry class and you'd have the one-hour lab, and the one-hour lab would be more work than, than the, the two-hour. The natural hour. lecture, yeah, and, that's and, true. And, you know, the hours spent in the laboratory, 
Um, you know, the programs are uh, not, I mean, those courses are not easy courses. Chemistry, biology, but I bet anatomy, you, hours and hours uh, spent But I wonder, like, if, this, if the sciences were a heavy concentration in the elementary school, by the time you <clears> did get to college, it would not be so hard. It would not be so foreign. Um, I know when I went to my elementary school, science was part of the platform. Fortunately, my children go to a school where science is intentionally injected into the platform. So it is a remarkable difference in the way that they think and the way that they, mm -hmm. um, even in the way that they play, it's mm -hmm. just completely insane. Mm -hmm. I am a huge fan of Lego blocks, mm -hmm. but the things that they can do with Lego blocks and the way that they try to explain it and then it's just a completely outstanding. Um, I know my son was seven and so he had to watch the weather. And so he was doing his little cloud experiment. And that's, it's wonderful to see those because that's where the conversation starts. But then once we get to college, when you see your college students who are majoring in science, what do they look like? Actually, in, at Columbia, we don't have, we have one science major and it's art and materials conservation. It's relatively new. Mm -hmm. But I have taught undergraduate students at UC Santa Barbara when I was a student. Um, at Columbia, the, I, there's a whole range. Some students feel completely uncomfortable with science and they'll say, I really don't like science, I can't do it. And other students are very proficient at it. And I think it totally has to do with their backgrounds. But we have to get away from this problem of students saying, it's too hard, I can't do it. Your, your children probably don't say that because they have a lot of experience with it. Well, yeah, right? I mean, and even it's interjected, it's, it's, part, it's integrated into just our social, you know, in our slang in our house, you know, so if someone says something and it's really out of the box, we'll be like, dude, that's not science. Right. You know, <laughs> that's, that's not floating. And, you know, so it, 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 it really is the way that you kind of think about it differently and the way you reconceptualize it. And, and it's also the way you teach it. Like I said, bringing up the past, you know, the old labs would be three, four hours long. There's ways to change the curriculum to make it more digestible, maybe less, less uh, burdensome. You know, five hours spent in a lab doing a chemistry experiment and then, having go the next day. There's things that could, I think that the educators could do to make it more marketable. There's a lot of this stuff that can be broken down. Yeah, but someone would say then, how can I do that if every time I turn around, I got to teach to the test? Yeah, there, there is actually a whole sort of paradigm shift within the teaching of science where uh, a lot of teachers will record their lectures online mm -hmm. and then have the students come and do the labs, answer the questions, and do the fun stuff, the labs, in class where it's hands-on. And that sounds like more of the kind of work that you're doing. It's mm -hmm. more about um, doing, creating, learning, instead of memorizing facts. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And in terms of what you're saying about how a lot of people would teach to the test, uh, that's one of the reasons why I commend a lot of the principals that have our programs within their schools. It's just the fact that when you're looking at what you need to do for the school year in terms of what topics and subject matter students need to learn, obviously, um, in terms of when you look at Chicago, you don't want your school to be on probation. A lot of these schools that, that we're in, um, they may be on probation. So you need to make sure that you, your students excel phenomenally within these tests. And as a teacher, you're looking at the certain test topics and you want to make sure that your students are going to do as well as possible because you want them to get those scores and it's all about the schools and whatnot. Now, with, with, our, with our program, or even when you look about the fundamentals of, of society, it, at the end of the day, you wanna know the ability that someone has to create a project or how can they bring value into your company. And it's not about the memorizations and just doing the tests. So as a society and as a country, we really need to think about how do we get our students to really have those skill sets to become productive members of society. So would you even go to the end to say that actually science is more so of a skill set then? Uh, I would say science... Because some people would treat math as, as, as actually a, you know, a, a court, uh, a solid set of skills. So is that the way that we need to conceptualize science? Yeah, when I look at science and math, because I, I studied engineering, so science and math being the two core topics, in terms of solving a problem, you're really conceptualizing uh, the math topics, the science topics, and putting it together to solve this problem. Um, you know, as she was saying about the, the climate and scaffolding all the way up to the climate changes, uh, you, you really incorporate both subject matters to understand why is the climate changing, like what, what different things in society are making these climate changes occur. 
And in terms of being a skill set, I'm moving towards it being through the use of science, you gain these different skill sets. And it's complex. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, science is complex. That's part of why it's so interesting. And you really have to learn the basics of how to ask questions and um, analyze yeah, it's data. It's an inquiry process. Right. As well as to pull it all together to actually yeah. make inferences about what you're seeing, even right. in everyday news. Oh, I guess for some people, though, that would be a dangerous thing to have a population that would want to do inquiry and ask questions. No. You know, no. <laughs> if you compare it to the arts, like, say, painting or, like, say, music, I mean, there's some gratification as you get better at that, I mm -hmm. think. Whereas, you right. know, when you're doing chemistry, you know, at the 100 level, 200 level, 300 level, um, like I said, sitting in the lab and just going through a lot of the material. You sound like you had a bad experience uh, in chemistry. In the lab. I've, had so much, I've had so much science, let me tell you. And um, so the gratification comes afterwards, mm -hmm. but the actual during the process of is, I don't think it would be the same as, you know, playing uh, a musical instrument and, 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 and accomplishing. I don't know if I agree. I don't know if I I don't know if you're sitting in the lab I and you're, I, you're, I tell you're you? told what the I, boundaries are. We're like, okay, just don't mix these two, but yeah. go for it. I mean, I Listen, think people can really Listen, each one has its really character and persona. It's not a criticism. It's just critiquing and understanding that one may have something along the way that's fun and then later on has other issues. This, you know, the sciences are... A lot of hard work up front, and you're not a chemist. You're not doing but anything. A lot of it is really fun. A lot of it's really interesting. A lot of it's well, complete it discovery but... and exploration. And I don't think that, I don't think that it has to be thought of as laborious. You know, mm. because actually, I'll give you an example. But what, when, what if it when is laborious? I was a, I was an art student, mm -hmm. and when I decided that I wanted to go back to school, I had to retake all of these math and science classes. You know, things like I don't know. More, more than you would ever, like, it's, you know, it was a lot. You know what it is. But, um, but when I took a physical science, physical earth sciences course, and I actually started to understand about layers of rocks and about weathering and erosion and about why mountains look the way they do and why they are on the planet, where they are on the planet, my whole worldview changed. It can be really exciting. Yeah. I'm not saying all science classes, but there's plenty of them that physical chemistry, you need a uh, hug. calculus, <laughs> you, you, need a, you need a hug through those classes, okay? Well, but some see, of it you grit your teeth and get through, but exactly. that's at the upper levels. So, and some people will gravitate toward, you know, engineering with mechanics, and some will gravitate toward computer and engineering. And that's the thing that I want to talk about. There are just so many different gradations of the sciences, so it's just not just, like, here's science. I mean, there are different areas. What do we have? We have computer science. There's information science. That's what I do. Mm -hmm. I mean, then we have what I guess we would call the hardcore science, the hard sciences. The physical sciences. The physical science, the applied the sciences. Earth. Yeah, so. Physicists, chemists. Yeah. Right. All right. The so space, the stars. So let me ask you this. So if we had Arnie Duncan at the table, and we wanted to talk to him about the relevancy and the importance of science and education. What would you say to him? Would you say he's getting it right? Would you say that there's something he needs to change? What would you say? I would say, so based on what, you know, with the State of the Union, you know, brought President Obama with the State of the Union, if their, their intentions are good, because they want to <laughs> invest in $100 million in, in STEM as soon as possible, and, you know, this great push for... Uh, you know, billion dollars within STEM over the, the next few years. I believe that those are those are good plans. We just need to see them being implemented, and being in the school system day in and day out. I see that, for instance, a lot of corporations or a lot of donations will be given to the schools for technology, but they don't have the proper training to teach those technologies. So imagine. And nothing to sustain those studies either. Right. Yeah. Nothing to sustain them. So you need to, the, the skill sets of the teachers and the training are very important. And yes, you're able to fund it. Just you got to have a great plan with it. Mm -hmm. um, so from what they're saying, I, I, you know, I, it looks like they're trying to push it more. And the big thing is hopefully these, these new standards, once you, once you have a core focus on these are science, we really want to emphasize science. And students need to perform well in science, and this is the test that, that, that drives it. I believe there will be a greater focus within the school system. Nick, what would you say? Yeah, I, I, I agree with that, and I think that there has to be a balance. Uh, social, you know, social sciences, arts, uh, the physical sciences. I think uh, part of um, understanding is, is, I mean, understanding is part of what we need, I think, to 
understand what, what our purpose here is on this planet and our lives and to understand, understand things, uh, the beauties. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to have a rounded education. So I think that dropping or um, you know, not keeping the students um, uh, well learned in the physical science would be not good. What do you think, Robin? Science is in everything, and you can pull all kinds of different subjects in to make science more interesting for students. And I think uh, that this idea that science should be about doing mm -hmm. would really help students to understand science concepts. So I'd really like to see these standards implemented. I know that it's voluntary for, for states to sign on, mm -hmm. but like with the reading and math, 45 of the 50 states have signed on to that program and are implementing the standards. But I think it's, it's really, you have to give the training to the teachers. That's what I would say to Arnie Duncan. Mm -hmm. Give the training to the teacher, to the teachers. And really, honestly, you know, some schools have the money to make these programs happen and they, they make it a priority. And other schools probably don't have the money and it's not considered a priority. And let, it, me, let me, let's ask about that. Do you think that, that that helps to propagate a gap or a marginalization of who and what groups actually go to study the sciences? Do you think that that, that kind of instigates that marginalization of the study? I think it does instigate it in a way where if, you, if students aren't exposed to these different uh, technologies, then they just know, don't know about it. And a lot of areas where you do have the proper funding, they are able to bring in the technology, the training for the teachers, and students really open their eyes to, to the world because they do have that exposure to it, as opposed to some areas that aren't properly funded and don't have a way of bringing those technologies into the school system. Um, our students aren't able to, to see it, number one, and number two, as, as Robin was just saying, in terms of the proper training, proper training requires funding, requires money to, to train your teachers properly, and for them to have the right technologies as well, that requires funding as well. Does your program also provide training for teachers? Yeah, we do professional development for teachers where our whole emphasis is project-based learning. Uh, we, we'll go, we've gone to schools and we've covered even social studies, uh, mathematics, uh, reading and writing and created projects because Similar to what Nick's saying, you want them to be well-rounded. And in these other topic areas, you can infuse sciences in just about any subject or even a project. You create a project out of any subject matter. Mm -hmm. And that professional development to teachers, I feel, equips them with the ability to enlighten students on that real-world aspect of all the subject matters. Now that's one of the things that I like, especially um, here with the City College of Chicago, is we do a lot of learning community courses. And are you guys familiar with the concept of learning community courses? Mm -mm. What you do is you take two, uh, say you will take an English 121 course and you'll pair it up with a science course and it becomes a learning community. So the students are all mm -hmm. in the same class, but the curriculum and the conversation of English, of that English class will bleed over into the science class. And then likewise, the mm -hmm. curriculum and the conversation of the science class will bleed over into mm -hmm. the English class. So it kind of helps to create this, this convention of reinforcing, reinforcing the study. So I think that's one of the things that would be really wonderful to see more so uh, in the college landscape are to see actually those learning communities. And if, especially if it's not possible to say, hey, you know, next time you're teaching this 21, 121, you think you put more science in it? They'll be like, of course I can't, you know. That's not my area of subject expertise, but to allow those learning communities to take place, I think, would be really wonderful. Yeah. Let, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I think the great thing about that in terms of learning communities is when you think about a, when you think about a true company, uh, let's take Motorola, for instance, the designing of a cell phone, you have all these different aspects involved. You have marketing, you have engineers, um, you have the press release. All these come into play when you're launching a product. Mm -hmm. And with those learning communities or even being able to provide students with a sense of this is how a true business works. And they're able to see that everyone connects together to make a successful uh, product launch or to make a, a business run successfully. And that's very important for them to understand. I think it is because, you know, I think a lot of times our students, they have, we have, um, have lost the art of what it means to think innovatively and you know to do the problem solving and to think creatively so the sciences really does provide that foundation what do you think would be the long-term implications for research and business if there is no boost in the studies of science it's going on now actually mm -hmm. I was just reading that um, 
over 50% of the patents in the U.S. are taken out by foreign entities. So they're applied for by people who are not actually living in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And so that's the kind of thing that will continue. And we're importing. I mean, we're importing doctors and people in uh, a lot of the uh, specialty areas because there's no American, uh, no Americans, you know, no, nobody wants to study it in school or think it's too many years. And so we just import them. Well, a lot of these foreign students who are coming to go to school in the U.S., I mean, the school system is still considered, the higher education is still considered to be a good school system. Mm. They come and then they're basically kicked out, so they take right. all their skills away. Mm. In um, the area where there's shortages, we do keep them. And my personal experience has been with, uh, with the American student versus the foreign student. Usually the American student, although we see all these things, is usually more innovative, more creative, believe it or not. That's been my personal experience. And, and talking to other people uh, in the area that uh, a lot of invention comes, although the numbers are shrinking, there's still plenty, plenty of um, creative thinkers in the, in the physical science areas. And a lot of these other countries have very rigid programs, and um, although they get to a, you know, the farthest point in, and excel in, in a, a particular area vertically, information-wise, they, um, they're just very rigid. They don't Sometimes they won't come up with certain things that the American student comes up with. So maybe there's something to be said about uh, our system that's not all that bad. Well, the U U.S. still is a leader in science. I mean, most yep. Nobel laureates come out of the U.S. Yeah. And so there's something that's being done right. But maybe. perhaps, um, perhaps you know, they're going to the best schools. What happens to the rest of those students? And perhaps they got the best education coming up through K through 12. And what happens to the rest of those students? I think it's a balance. So. Yeah, but you know, you do have to keep, keep an eye on things if something does fall out of uh, balance. And maybe this show is one of the reasons why. Yeah. Sean, you get the last word. All right. And so what you guys are saying that our higher education system, I feel, is phenomenal. And that's why we do get a lot of foreign students to come into um, the MITs and the you know, the great universities that are out there. In terms of K through 12, if, you're, if we're not focusing on those areas, they're not going to go on to the great college universities for higher education. And in terms of once they do graduate and go on into the industries, the technology industries, and there are shortages there, um, as you're saying, we will keep those um, professionals within the United States. But a lot of times I feel because I've had friends, you know, in terms of work visas and whatnot, it, it's very stringent and difficult for them to stay, and they have to go through a lot of different processes as well. Now, um, as opposed to what we want to do is really focus through to K through 12 to be able to not have a shortage when it goes on to higher education. And that'll probably be a great <laughs> place where to end. So that's our show for today. The conversation continues online right now at wycc.org. See you next time on The Professors.